Well, thanks for inviting me to talk today. Um, so really it's about the small renal mass and I, uh, I, I'm gonna just start out by just defining what I mean by that because uh, a lot of people talk about the small renal mass, but what does that really mean? And then talk a little bit about the management strategies that we can apply to it. Uh, mainly surveillance versus surgery, and then talk a little bit about decision making, as she said. So I, I figured we'd start with a case presentation to sort of put um, a patient to the sort of the whole decision making process. So this is a patient I had, 60 year old male who presented to the ER, and he had some lower back pain. And this is actually a really common scenario we find. He came with another problem, and then the ER obtained a CT scan. Even though his problem was actually lower back pain, it was just some muscle strain. He was ultimately diagnosed also with this small renal mass, which was discovered, which is 1.6 centimeters. And, and so this is, this is often how these present. And so the question is, what's his diagnosis and what are his options? And I'm going to use um, this case to kind of circle back at the end to talk a little bit about putting this in perspective. So to start, what is a small renal mass? Well, it's defined as a renal tumor less than four centimeters. And you know, in the United States, I think it's hard to understand what a centimeter is, even myself. And so I put a roller up here just to put it in perspective. So forgive me if that's too, too, too simple. But for me, I just think of it, it's like a little over an inch and a half for a four centimeter tumor. And then, um, and sometimes it's defined as less than six centimeters, depending on where you read. But, but generally, it's four centimeters. It's asymptomatic, meaning there really are no symptoms that go along with it, um, generally speaking. It's confined to the kidney, so it hasn't spread. And then in terms of imaging um, qualities, we look at um, whether it's solid appearing, and then we, we, we call it enhancing with IV contrast. What that means is it's bright with IV contrast. And so those are the things we're looking for, and that was the characteristic of this gentleman's tumor. So a little background about small renal masses. Well, over time, the number of small renal tumors has increased. And as you can see from 1997 to 2006, there's been this in, um, increase. And that's due in part because we're imaging more in the ER. We, we do CTs and MRIs on many people. And I bet number, if not almost all of us here, has had some kind of imaging for something. And so we call that an incidental finding whenever we find something that's not really related to why you got the imaging in the first place. And, um, and you can see this actually separates out the graph based on stage. And, and these small renal masses are, are by definition stage one. Um, and you can see that top line um, going up. See, um, this top line is, is on the incline, and that, and that really is, is um, uh, responsible for that, that increase in, in, in renal masses. And so uh, what we know is that in the 1970s, it's really only 10% um, that, were find for, were, that were found on CT or MRI imaging, and now it's almost half of patients with low stage are found this way. And the, the issue is the greatest incidence actually in older folks in um, over 70. And in the autopsy series where they actually looked at patients after they died for other, um, other causes before widespread imaging was in play, nearly three quarters of the, um, of the renal cell masses were clinically, in a, uh, were clinically in apparent, meaning that um, the majority of them, that wasn't the cause of death. And so that supports the thought that maybe these renal cancers grow slowly. And so that represents a dilemma for us because um, if we're having these small renal masses and there are older patients, and perhaps these patients, um, the risk for surgery or treatment is, is a little bit higher in, in these patients. So can we safely observe some of these tumors? And then if so, what are the characteristics that define the tumors that can be observed um, and potentially undergo delayed uh, intervention or no intervention at all? And then finally, what criteria, whoops, what criteria might guide our decision between treatment and observation? So this is just a, a schematic. These are generally the three categories of, of management options for small renal masses. So first is active surveillance, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, it's also known as uh, watchful waiting, if you've heard of that term. The second is ablative therapy. I'm not going to really talk about that today, but that's cryotherapy and radiofrequency ablation. What that means is cryotherapy is freezing the tumor, and then radiofrequency ablation is putting a, a probe in the tumor and basically heating it to destroy the tissue. And these are newer therapies, so the longer term um, outcomes are a little less known. So I'm not going to talk about that so much today. Um, the third uh, option is surgery, and that's partial or radical nephrectomy. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. 
Um, I have a little uh, X over radical nephrectomy, not to say that that's not an appropriate therapy for some people with small renal masses, but generally speaking, that's pretty aggressive, so we try to steer away from that if we can, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So starting with active surveillance, what is it? Well, this is an approach that involves really no intervention at all other than the close follow-up of the patient, uh, mainly with clinic visits, history and physical exam, um, laboratory studies, and imaging, whether it be CT, MRI, and in some cases, ultrasound for some patients. And despite the earlier detection of these renal masses, there's, been, there's not been a clear improvement in cancer-specific survival. So that suggests to us that maybe treatment of some of these tumors may not be necessary. And we know that up to 20 to 30 percent of these very small renal masses actually will be benign. So we don't want to overtreat um, when we don't need to be. So what's the issue here? Well, the problem is that um, not all re renal tumors behave the same, and it's really difficult to tell which one is going to have malignant potential and which, one are ben which ones are benign. We do have biopsies um, to aid our um, to aid our, di uh, our decision making process, but a negative biopsy doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's not a renal cell carcinoma. Also, CT MRI and imaging can actually understage renal cell carcinoma. So who is active surveillance for? Well, it's reserved mainly for patients who have a limited life expectancy due to other competing medical conditions. Um, in patients where surgery is not an option and intervention where the intervention has a significant chance of decreasing quality of life. Now that's not to say that's that's all it's for. I mean there are younger patients that are very appropriate for this and and really what I what I really stress to my patients is this is a shared decision that's not just the surgeon who's making this decision it's very important that the patient weighs in as well so it's really a shared decision making process. So this is just a general scheme but certainly there are many other patients who this would be appropriate for as well. So how do we decide when to treat or if to treat? Well, we don't have a lot. We have biopsy and that can be helpful, um, but there's also the growth rate and I think that's really the mainstay of how we decide um, what we do. So there is a study that looked at over 200 patients who had an average follow-up of two and a half years and they took a look at the growth rate. The average growth rate overall was about 0.28 centimeters per year, which is small. Um, and that was smaller than the average growth rate for RCC proven masses, which is 0.4 centimeters per year. And so we, we generally like to think that um, if there is an uh, increased growth rate, that's going to um, sort of push us toward an actual intervention. The other thing that was helpful to know in the study is that only three of those uh, 234 patients had metastatic disease, and of, on all three ended up having some kind of growth. So there were no reports of metastatic disease without some renal mass growth, and that's actually um, comforting to know since we use that as part of our, uh, our decision-making process. This, but does no growth mean no cancer? And the answer is unfortunately no. Um, this is a smaller study looking at two groups. Uh, one group had no growth, one had growth, and you can see that the renal cell carcinoma on pathology in that last row is not that different. Um, so it's, we really don't have um, a perfect method, but we do use growth rate um, to, to sort of guide uh, what we do know in, in biopsy as well. So what's the follow-up schedule if you're placed on active surveillance? So the first thing I'll say is that compliance is mandatory. So you, again, you want to have a patient who's going to come back because it's important to, to keep monitoring this. So if I have a patient who I don't, don't think or, or it's going to be very difficult for them to come back to see me, I may not um, recommend active surveillance for that patient. Um, again, uh, percutaneous biopsy can be considered, and in the American Urological Association guidelines, um, they mention the role of biopsy in that, in that way, and they also recommend that there is a, a, a CT or an MRI of, uh, or imaging of some sort at six months and then annually thereafter. And that's pretty um, uh, conservative. We, we actually do a little bit more of an aggressive surveillance regimen at UNC. So in the first year, we'll uh, image every three to four months. And the reason we do that is because you really want to have a growth trajectory. You want to have two points on that line so you can see you're here or you're here. And that kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're going with the um, surveillance. And then if there's stable size um, in that first year, we'll move that out to every six months and then, and then beyond that to annually. And then if there was a biopsy proven renal cell, and so we know that we're following renal cell carcinoma versus just a small renal mass, 
then uh, it's recommended to get an annual chest x-ray just to look if there's any spread of disease. Um, and then I have this last question, what's the trigger to treat? And I, it's intentionally there's no answer there because there really is no um, gold standard on exactly when to treat. But I think that it's, again, a shared decision between the patient and the, and the surgeon. And I also think that it, it really comes down to growth rate um, and then a lot, of, a lot about what the patient, um, what the risks are for the patient for treatment, how sick they are, and, and so forth. So that moves into surgery, so when we do treat. And um, I just, I know many of you know this, if not all, but I'm gonna just say this one more time and kind of, kind of go through what a radical nephrectomy is and what a partial nephrectomy is for those who, who are not aware. So radical nephrectomy is removing the entire kidney, and a partial nephrectomy is just removing the kidney mass, leaving the rest of the kidney, the normal kidney, behind. So this is just a, a schematic, but it's, it's pretty simple. There are three main steps. The first step is to find the renal artery and vein. And then we use um, either a stapler or, um, or some kind of clips or um, just suture to divide the blood vessels. And then the second step is to divide the ureter, the, basically the tube that runs from the kidney down to the bladder. And then finally, removing the remaining attachments of the kidney, and the entire kidney is removed. For a partial nephrectomy, like I said, it was just, it's just removing the actual kidney tumor. And so it's similar steps, but obviously um, a little bit different here, because instead of uh, dividing the renal vessels, here we, we identify and then we put clips on them, or, or bulldogs that are actually going to be removed at the end of the case. So we clip it to, re to make sure the blood supply is not such that we're going to have a lot of bleeding when we cut the tumor out. And that's the second step, is, is removing that tumor and just kind of cutting out that area, and then finally sewing that defect together, and then removing the clips at the end. So I just want to talk a little bit about the rationale for partial nephrectomy. You remember at the beginning I had that like X around radical nephrectomy again. Radical nephrectomy can be appropriate in many um, scenarios, but partial nephrectomy, the rationale for, um, for doing partial nephrectomy over a radical um, stems from a couple different things. So this, the first, um, the first study that I want to talk about is just the fact that they looked at chronic kidney disease, so renal function that's diminished. And that was an independent risk factor for death, cardiovascular events like heart attack, stroke, and then hospitalization as well. And so they did another study that looked at patients' survival for those who had small renal masses in both radical and partial nephrectomy. And the top line here um, is partial nephrectomy, and they had better survival than those with radical nephrectomy. And the basis for that may um, result from a greater decrease in the renal function after radical nephrectomy. And all of this is up for debate, but this is the, the, at least what we think about why we um, push partial nephrectomy over radical nephrectomy. There's also been shown to be an improved quality of life after partial. There's been shown to be equivalent cancer-free survival in patients who had partial versus radical for these small renal masses. And then I just want to remind you, up to 30% of these renal masses under 4 centimeters are benign. So again, we may be taking out a whole kidney for a benign lesion. So despite all of these um, factors that I mentioned, uh, it's still fairly uh, underutilized for renal masses that are small. And you can see this, um, this uh, chart. So the black line, the black bars here are radical nephrectomy, and these um, lightly shaded bars are partial. You can see that um, that's been increasing from the late 1980s up to the early 2000s. It continues to increase um, currently. Um, but the potential reasons for that underutilization is that there's a belief that maybe patients aren't really at risk for chronic kidney disease if they already have a normal normal kidney function or if they have a normal kidney on the other side. Um, there's also a question of lack of comfort of the surgeon in performing um, the partial nephrectomy because there was, uh, previously, there was a lot of people who were very comfortable with the radical nephrectomy doing, using, I'm sorry, using small incisions for that. And doing, it with, um, doing that for a partial nephrectomy was more technically challenging. But now um, there's more use of the robot, and I'll talk about that just in a moment, um, and that has allowed a lot of surgeons who perhaps couldn't do that with pure laparoscopy to do it with a different type of technology and still have good outcomes and still have small incisions for the patients. Um, 
And so, as I mentioned, um, the robotic partial wasn't um, really described until 2004, and now we're seeing much more utilization of that uh, since 2008, and I think that's going to just continue to increase. So just a little word about what the robot is, and I, I say this because this is a really common question I get from patients in the clinic because they think that the, an actual robot is doing the surgery, and that's not the case. So it's actually the surgeon who is, um, who is really at this console that's away from the patient that's making the robot move. So it really isn't automated in any way. There's a surgeon involved. In fact, there are two surgeons involved, um, the surgeon who's at the console and then an assistant surgeon who's next to the patient sort of in this background over here. And this person actually puts the instruments in all these arms and also assist the, the console surgeon. And it's important to remember that the surgeon's hands are placed in these special devices, so their actual fingers are, are actually making um, all the movements themselves and, um, and, and performing the procedure. And this is what it looks like on the patient's um, belly. So uh, just a few small incisions, whereas it used to be for an uh, open procedure, if it, was, it would be a very large incision and um, they would they would have um, uh, a longer stay in the hospital, uh, it would be a longer recovery time. So this has um, made a big impact for a lot of patients with small renal masses who require treatment. So these are just a couple pictures from um, the OR just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. So this is just norm normal kidney is going to be flat, um, but these small renal masses will show up as just sort of little um, mound, and you can usually tell, and if you can't, we can actually put an ultrasound in to identify the tumor. So we identify it, and like I said, we, we have already identified our renal vessels, our artery and vein, and we're going to put a clamp on it so that we reduce flow just temporarily so we don't get a lot of blood loss. And then we take scissors um, and we cut around the tumor. It almost looks like an acorn once you remove it because you're, it's almost like a, a little cone that you're um, cutting out right here. So this is the base of the tumor, and they're cutting down, and you can cut all the way around this tumor and then remove it. Once you're done, you get this divot. Um, right here in the kidney. So this is all healthy kidney. And, um, and once you have that, you're going to take um, really just a fancy uh, needle and thread to sew it back together. And that rem that's the uh, final part of the procedure. So at UNC, you can even see this um, takeoff of partial nephrectomy. This is for um, tumors that were less than seven centimeters. So these are small renal tumors, some, but some of them are, are larger. And you can see that over the years, um, these partials are really overtaking um, radical nephrectomy, which is in the light blue. And then it's even more dramatic when you look at these true small renal masses that are less than four centimeters, and you can see this kind of dramatic uptick in partial nephrectomy. So how does the follow-up schedule differ from active surveillance? And that's something to think about in terms of how often you want to be seen. And um, the um, AUA guidelines, again, they recommend, um, even though this is, again, there's not a lot of evidence that's behind all of this. This is sort of just expert guidelines. They recommend a baseline imaging within 3 to 12 months after surgery. And that's just to take a look at how things look, um, sort of at the baseline, so you have something to compare um, in the future if anything um, is worrisome. If you underwent a radical nephrectomy, uh, additional imaging is actually optional in, in these small renal masses. And so you could potentially be done with imaging, um, at least from the kidney standpoint, um, at that point. If you had a partial nephrectomy, the additional imaging um, is recommended annually every year for about three years. And, it, and, you know, in some cases you may want to extend that. And then for all patients, a yearly chest x-ray for three years to evaluate for any spread of disease um, based on the AUA guidelines. And again, this comes from the AUA as well. This is a, um, their decision-making algorithm. I kind of, um, it's a little more complicated than this, but I think this is really the, um, the gist of what they're getting at. And they, they categorize patients into four categories. So we have healthy patients here and here, and we have sick patients. And we all have very small masses, which are the masses less than four centimeters, and then small masses, which are the, this um, four to six centimeter category. And you can see that really the gold standard, yes, is surgery. And, and, and when I say surgery, partial nephrectomy is, is truly gold standard, but radical nephrectomy in some cases, especially if the tumor is in a location where a partial nephrectomy is not, um, is not able to be, to, to be performed. Um, but you can see that it's also recommended uh, when patients are sick. Um, 
So you can see it here, either surveillance surgery, because this is a large, slightly larger mass, surveillance or ablation, which I didn't talk about today, but cryo or radiofrequency ablation for the very small mass in a sick patient. So, but it's still an option, and that's what I, I was mentioning. It's still an option for anybody um, with these uh, very small or small renal masses, and that's something to consider. And again, it's about the decision-making process between the patient and the surgeon. So I want to circle back to that first case presentation and sort of put it in perspective, because uh, this patient sort of did both. And um, so it's a 60-year-old male, again, with the 1.6 centimeter renal mass. And he opted for active surveillance, which I think was appropriate. He actually had some comorbidities. He had had a stroke, um, and he had some other uh, medical issues. So I think active surveillance was very appropriate for him. Um, and so we decided to do imaging every three months just to start, um, to kind of get that trajectory and to understand the growth rate of the kidney tumor. And so what we found was that it was a stable size at the three month, but at six month we found a, a jump in the size. And you can see there's that first um, image, and then here it looks uh, what it looks like at six months. And the whole point is to capture this before it becomes something bigger, um, but yet not over-treat those who really didn't require treatment to begin with. So we made the decision together to go ahead and um, pursue robotic partial nephrectomy. And so that was performed, and the path confirmed a renal cell carcinoma. It still was um, staged 1, uh, T1A, because it was very small. And we, um, for the guidelines, obtained a follow-up scan about three months later. And you can actually see a little bit where the defect was, no tumor anymore. Um, but that's generally the appearance that we find after uh, for the baseline follow-up scan. So what we're gonna do with him is annual imaging for three years because we did a partial nephrectomy, and that'll include not just a CT, but also a chest X-ray. And so far, he's been doing very well. So just my summary slide, I wanna just, um, these are the key points here. I think small renal masses are being detected with increasing frequency. We're gonna see more and more of these as time goes on and as we do more and more imaging in the ER. Um, there's no reliable way yet to know which tumors are going to behave aggressively. Uh, and so active surveillance and some ablative therapies like cryo and radiofrequency ablation are options for the carefully selected patient or the high-risk surgical patient. Um, but partial nephrectomy still is the gold standard, and we have to remember that when we're um, counseling the pa our patients. Um, now with this, uh, the advent of the robotic um, partial nephrectomy, it's become easier on the patient to have this surgery, and that's an important point. Um, I'm not saying that it's an easy procedure to go through, but it certainly um, it can be easier than the open partial, and that, um, that's saying something right there. Uh, but I think that um, our hope is that improvements in both biopsy techniques and imaging techniques um, and even just molecularly characterizing the tumor itself will help us to better um, characterize not just, um, just in general these tumors, but really individualize it for each patient. And that's really the hope. Once we have that, it'll be even easier to figure out who would be best served with active surveillance. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.